Keep up the good work, guys. It's making a difference. James chapter 1, verse 1. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live our faith, that we are called to now live in such a way that our life brings glory to God, that a transformed life from someone who has received a spiritual birth results in a change in attitudes as well as a change in actions so that God is glorified in our lives. Now, we just finished going through verse by verse through the book of Galatians. And while Galatians' emphasis is that we are made right with God, we are justified through faith in Christ alone. James gives us a complementary idea. Yes, you are made right solely through faith, but once you have received God's righteousness, now you live in such a way, the action of, of living in such a way that your faith is proven. And, and so these are complementary ideas. The message of the gospel is not that we earn our way up to heaven, but God loves you so much that he reached down and lifted you up through the person of Jesus Christ. And you're made right with God simply through faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen? And now that you are made right, that, that you live in such a way, that you live your faith to bring glory to God. Not only is God glorified, not only do you experience true contentment as you live for him, but it's the only way that you actually can know that you have true, genuine faith. That your actions now glorify God. You're, you're living your faith. And so this morning, we're going to consider an introduction to the book of James. That's the subject of what we're talking about. And really, the theme throughout the, this book is going to be that we live our faith, that you live your faith. So James, chapter 1, at verse 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. And we're just going to focus on that one verse this morning. Pray with me. Lord, we ask that you would open up our eyes to the truth. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts to your truth. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and the feet to walk in this truth, hands to live this truth, that you would transform us to the image of your Son. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to consider this morning, we're going to talk about who was James, we're going to talk about to whom James wrote, and we're going to consider why James wrote. So who was James, to who was he writing, and why did he write? And before we do that, I just want to give you a context about this book. So the book of James is the earliest New Testament book. It is the first book of the New Testament. And so it's written uh, somewhere between 45 and 48 A.D. And the reason we know that is that this James, who wrote this book, was leading or helping to preside over a council that met in Jerusalem of religious leaders, including the apostles, that determined that Gentiles, non-Jews, did not need to be circumcised to enter into a covenant relationship with God, nor did they have to perfectly follow the Mosaic law to be right with God. That the determination of the gospel messages were made right solely through faith in Christ. And James makes no reference to that council, which we know happened in 48 A.D. that we read about in Acts chapter 15. So it's written before then, somewhere between 45 and, and the early part of 48 A.D. So it's the earliest of the New Testament books. A second characteristic that, that's interesting is that it's got a uniquely Jewish feel for a New Testament book, a uniquely Jewish feel. So this James, his uh, name in Hebrew is Yaakov. Uh, Jew, Jews, we don't name people James. We don't go there, you know. There are patriarchs. Abraham, we like that one. Isaac, Isaac, we go there. Jacob, right? Yaakov in, in Hebrew. And so um, when that name is translated in the New Testament, is given the name James as part of the King James translation. The king got to see his name in print. And, and so that's why we see James. But it, it's Yaakov. And, and so the early church, remember, in the, the earliest decades of the church, it is primarily Jewish Christians. And so as James is writing, as James is thinking, there's that lens. When James talks about the assembled, he refers to it as Synagogue, the, the Greek word for synagogue. Later, when Matthew writes about the assemble, he uses another Greek word, ekklesia, in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, that we translate 
church. But James is thinking from that Jewish perspective. Um, James, as he is writing this, it is incredibly practical about living our faith. It is, if you imagine, uh, James is, is, the book of James is like New Testament or Christian Proverbs. If you like reading Proverbs, and I, I assume many of you do, it's wonderful. There's 31 chapters in that book if you read one a day. And as you read it, it's not like a narrative. It, there are these uh, pithy ideas. So each one of the verses or each couple of verses is a, essentially a standalone idea. And they're very practical uh, just wisdom. And so think about it this way. When a uh, non-Jew talks about wisdom, it's kind of like this philosophical thought. When Jews talk about wisdom, it's understanding knowledge about God and then applying that knowledge about God to your life. Truths about God that are applied to your life is when a Jew talks about wisdom. That's how James is writing. So as we go through this letter together, what I want to encourage you to do is gather these as pearls of wisdom. String them together and put that around your neck, halfway between your head and your heart. That's what James is trying to do. He's trying to appeal to us in the heart, the place of emotion. He's trying to appeal to our spiritual sense and our minds to help us to understand how we live our faith. Practical wisdom, like Christian Proverbs. A fourth aspect of this letter is it's full of imperatives or commands. There's only 108 verses in the whole book. 48 of them are commands. And so it's telling us how to do it's not simply telling us what we should be or who we are or what we are or whose we are. It's telling us how to live our faith. And so Martin Luther, the great reformer, objected to James because there was such an emphasis on doing. And Martin Luther thought it may be an obstacle to the truth of the gospel, which is that we're made right through faith alone. But it's actually just another complementary part of the gospel message. This fact that we're made right, now we live this life. Um, the reason why this uh, is part of our New Testament and the reason why the 27 books that we have in the New Testament are part of the New Testament, it meets four tests. Okay, so uh, the first test is, was the letter generally accepted in the early church? And this letter had been circulated throughout the regions and not only in Israel, but into the Gentile world, the Greco-Roman world, and was accepted in all of the churches. There was no issue there. Second, there's a call to act. In other words, all the letters that we have in our New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, call us to action. There's a spiritual dynamic that's life transforming that is being encouraged. A third is that it agrees. It, the book of James agrees with all the other books that are part of our New Testament. So it's this idea of acceptance, action, agreement, and the fourth, apostolic authorship. Apostolic authorship. As we're going to discover, James is an apostle of Jesus. And more than that, let's now introduce who is James? Who is James? So in the Gospels, we have on occasion lists of the 12 original disciples. And there are two of them named James. And this guy's neither of them. But I'll tell you about those two anyways real quick, if I can, if you want me to. Okay. I just want to, I was going to do it anyways, but this way you feel, <laughs> you feel like you got a say in it, so it's better. Um, so one James is, is um, James, the brother of John, uh, the apostle John who wrote the gospel of John, the revelation, first, second, and third John. This is his brother. They are the sons of Zebedee. They're referred to often in the gospel as the sons of Zebedee. Whenever I read that name, I always go like, Zebedee do da. It just... <laughs> It's more fun in my head that way, I don't know. Um, it's not that James. Uh, sadly, that James was uh, martyred. We read about it in Acts chapter 12 and 45 AD. So it is not uh, that James. The other James is referred to as James the Lesser. So every time you read about James, you refer to as James the Lesser, not because he was diminutive of height, I'm vertically challenged, so I know that feeling. Um, but he's called James the Lesser compared to this other James, the brother of John. Um, 
Pastor Joe and I and others from our church, we were in Turkey, and you see the magnificent imperial mosques and the magnificent structures and palaces that the sultans of the Ottoman Empire built. And, and they have names like Solomon the Magnificent, you know, and, and there's nobody like Solomon the Mediocre or Solomon the Meh. They're like, oh, Solomon the Magnificent. I, I think, like, if you're Solomon the Meh, it's not that impressive, like James the Lesser. Meh. Yeah, James the Mediocre, that, that's the sense. So the only thing we know about that James is just that his name is mentioned in the list of the 12. So presumably, he is not the author as well. So who is this James? This James is the half-brother of Jesus. So we read in Mark 7 that Mary and Joseph had children after uh, Jesus' immaculate conception, after Jesus had been conceived of the Holy Spirit. Mary gave birth to brothers and sisters. James is the oldest of the brothers. He had a younger brother named Jude, who Jude means praise in Hebrew, who also pens a New Testament letter. It's a very short one-chapter letter that you read just before the book of Revelation. So that's the James that we're talking about here, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, this James uh, did not come to faith during Jesus' lifetime, or excuse me, his earthly lifetime. He came to faith after the resurrection. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to his half-brother after the resurrection, and his brother realized that this was, in fact, his Lord, his Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and surrendered his life to him, as did his half-brother, or his other half-brother, Jude. Um, you just, you could appreciate that there would be some conflict uh, between growing up with Jesus as your, I mean, I, I'm a younger brother, so I, I grew up knowing how to provoke my older brother, but, you know, it, it, it would be difficult for younger brothers to submit to the authority of an older brother, obviously difficult for an older brother to submit to a younger brother. But you can imagine that tension generally, but you just think about it when you're, Older sibling is Jesus. You know, it's just kind of the conflict. Like, the guy never seems to do anything wrong, right? So the only time we see that Jesus uh, kind of gets rebuked, so to speak, from his, his parental unit is this time where the family went to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover when Jesus is 12 years old. And as the, was the tradition in that culture, men uh, walked together. A boy who had been a bar mitzvah was now considered a son of the covenant. He was treated as a man. He walked with the men. The men generally walked ahead. Women and small children walked behind. So they travel about 15 to 20 miles. They stop for the night. And Joseph says to Mary, hey, where's Jesus? And Mary's like, I thought he was with you. Now, you'd be in a terror if that was your kid and, and nobody knew where he was. Just think if you lost the son of God. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh, we have lost the son of God. Um, they race back to Jerusalem. There at the temple, Jesus is teaching uh, the, the scholars of the law of Moses, the rabbinical leaders. He's asking them questions. They're asking him questions. There's this exchange. And Mary shows up. And uh, most of you, because you, you grew up with Gentile parents, you, you think of Mary as this little Gentile girl with blonde hair and a little turned up nose. She's all Jew. So she goes immediately to the guilt mode with Jesus because there's no Chinese food yet. All my people know is guilt and Chinese food. And she goes to the guilt mode. And she's like, you know, your father and I were beside ourselves, worried about you. How could you do this? And Jesus makes it really clear to Mary, um, you know, Joseph's not my dad. His, his response is, why are we worried? Didn't you know that I'd be about my father's business? And so, in essence, even when they're upset with Jesus, he reminds them who he is. And you just imagine in that household, it could be challenging for James and Jude watching their brother who seemed just in every sense to be just like them until he began his earthly ministry at the wedding feast at Cana at about 30 years of age. And so, tension. As you start the, this letter, James begins and says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, the Greek term that we translate bondservant was uh, used to distinguish a typical servant, which would be someone who might have been sold into bondage uh, because they couldn't pay their bills or uh, forced upon them as a prisoner of war or a host of other reasons in the Roman Empire. A bondservant is one who voluntarily submits to the authority of a master. That's what James is saying. He's voluntarily submitted himself to the authority of his master. And, and this is what all disciples of Jesus would say. We are bondservants of our Lord. We are submitted, voluntarily submitted to his authority. And the goal of that relationship is that we should become like our master. That's what it means to be a disciple, that you receive training and influence and input so that you can emulate, imitate your master. Our master is Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is what James is saying. My master is Jesus. And, and as we look at the life of James, we see several ways that James displayed Christ-like character and conduct. So I just want to point out with you five ways that James lived in such a way that it reflected Jesus that I think all of us should consider. First of all, he was a man of prayer. He's a man of prayer. This is James' nickname. Uh, they called him Camel Knees. The guy spent so many hours in prayer that his knees developed calluses like a camel. And so I don't know if the guy went around in shorts uh, or how they knew this about him, but he had the nickname Camel Knees from the hours of prayer. As we, we think about this, think about Jesus and his words when he cleansed the temple. He said, my house is to be a house of Prayer. Now, yes, Bible teaching, important for us to understand God. Praising God through song as a way to express worship, of course, is important. Sharing love with one another, of course, is important, right? But the, the most important aspect of the Christian life, the most spiritual of spiritual disciplines, is prayer. And we, as a community of faith, uh, we need to recognize that this is something that's normative of Christian life. It, it is just like fish swimming, right? This is what Christians do as part of the Christian life to emulate what Jesus did. Jesus woke up hours before the sun came up and prayed. He, he prayed with intensity and intimacy. This is what we love to learn to do. And yet, the enemy of men's souls... It seemed to distract us, hinder us, make us think that prayer is something that is only reserved for super spiritual people. We find it awkward sometimes to gather and to pray out loud with other people. Like, oh, I, you know, it can be so intimidating, man, when you are in a group of people and somebody just starts to pray and it's like, like gold is just dripping off their tongue. It's like, oh, that was so good. I don't want to say anything. You know, uh, very first Bible study, Bible study I taught uh, was at a senior residence, and there was this guy from the local church where I was worshiping that came, and he's part of this motorcycle gang, and this dude is huge. I mean, like an eclipse, blocking out the sun huge. Shows up at the senior in his full leather vest, and he's tatted all over, and the guy's name is Booger. Like, I, I'm not going to question him about it. He pulled my arms off and beat me to death. It's like, great, whatever. Um, and so I say, hey, Booger, can you pray? <laughs> That's why I told you it was his name first. And I thought, that was kind of rude of you to call him that. Um, and this guy just starts to stammer and explain, like, I, I can't pray in front of people. He was like terrified. Here, here's this guy who's the scariest looking dude you would ever see. And he was so afraid of the thought of praying with people. And I'm just like, hey, man, it's, it's just like talking to God. Just, just, you don't have to impress anybody. You're just talking to God. And he started to pray and just pour his heart out to God. And when he got done, I looked up and people were wiping tears away. He, he, he got it. And, and you know, I just want to encourage you guys. Um, We've got National Day of Prayer coming up this Thursday. We're going to observe it in the cafe at 530. Um, let's come and, and pray, not simply for 
our nation and our nation's leaders, not simply for police and first responders in our community, not simply for our schools going from the university. Let's pray for families and individuals in need of healing, struggling marriages, lonely people, financial needs. Let's pray for our stuff, man. Can we do that? Yeah, let's make that a priority. So James is a man of prayer. Second, uh, James is a man of the book. He understood the word of God. He knew the word of God, and he lived the word of God. He's going to quote the Old Testament 45 times in 108 verses. Um, he, he's just living it. Uh, even though he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, he recognized that when his older brother gave the Sermon on the Mount, that what he was saying was profound. And even though he didn't realize that this was God speaking, he sat there and he listened because he references the Sermon on the Mount repeatedly throughout this book, and it hadn't been published yet. So it meant that he had to be there at the Sermon on the Mount on that spring day, and he had to pay attention. He had to learn it. And what he's exhorting us is not simply to hear the word, but to actually do the word. And we need to realize the importance for us of being people of the book, that you have to understand the value in your life of this book that is uniquely inspired by God. You have to learn it so that you can understand God's love for you, that you can be comforted by the hope and peace that God has, and, and that you can see where your life is out of alignment with God's will by his spirit revealing that to you, and then submit to his will. Because apart from the word of God, you're going to make God in your image rather than understanding that God made you in his. And this is his image. So an encouragement. Uh, third, that James was a spiritual leader. James was a spiritual leader. That uh, He is a leader of the early church in Jerusalem. We read about that in Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 29. Paul describes him in Galatians 2 as a pillar of the church. Both Peter and Paul recognize that he is a spiritual leader in the church. And in light of all this tension between James and his older brother Jesus growing up, that makes him feel like I am the last qualified guy. I was living in the same roof. I shared a bedroom with him, and I didn't think he was anything. Who am I to be a spiritual leader? I look out among you, and I see so many people capable of being spiritual leaders. And the problem is that somehow you've let someone convince you, the enemy of men's souls, really, that you can't do this. And the only one who, who's winning in that is Satan. Uh, influence is leadership. If you have people that share a home with you, whether it's family or roommates, you have influence. If you work with people, you have influence. If you go to school with people, there's people that you influence. If you recreate, you have influence. If you live and you're not on top of a hill separated from people by 60 miles, you have influence with your neighbors. Leadership is merely influencing people in a Right direction. Spiritual leadership is helping people to grow in Christ. Are you with me on this? Yeah. And, and so you're, if you're sitting here like, oh, I can't do that. Oh, you, PB, you know, you, you're like talking and you're not even looking at notes. I can't do that, man. Oh, my gosh. First of all, if this makes you feel more comfortable, I'll, I'll read it. James was a leader of the church at Jerusalem. He also recognized by Peter and Paul as a leader. Acts 12, Acts 15, Galatians 1.19, Galatians 2.9. God's people are all called to lead those that God has influenced us to grow in Christ. Um, right, so it's not, let's not put form over substance here at all. Let's understand this. If you got involved in a neighborhood group, in a small group, and, and you recognize like, hey, I could lead a group. Or if you got involved in an area of service in the church and you thought, wow, um, you know, I, I started off and I, I was a 
you know, part of an usher team, and now I'm helping to assist. And, and you just realize that very naturally, supernaturally, that God was giving you influence to help others to grow in Christ. And do it because this is what Jesus is calling his disciples to do. It's what he called the original 12 to do. It's what he's calling you to do. So James, first of all, man of prayer. Second, a man of the book. Third, a spiritual leader. A fourth aspect of James' life here is that he was humble. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 7, we are reminded that we're to have the heart of Christ, which is the, the mind of humility. And humility is not simply, um, you know, like, man, I heard this guy on the radio. It's like he said that I am so humble and because I am even more awesome than I think I am. That is not humility. That is irony, bro. Um, humility is not just thinking less of yourself, which is a, a healthy response, but it is thinking of others first and thinking more highly of others than yourself. That's what we're to emulate. As you open this introduction to this book, think about how James could have started this book. James, an awesome apostle. James. The brother of Jesus, the guy we shared a room together. James, the leader of the church at Jerusalem. Wow, that's a pretty impressive pedigree. But he doesn't bother, he doesn't play any of those cards. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the other day I was feeling underappreciated, unappreciated by uh, someone I'd been serving and someone I love, and um, I, I'm just, you know, having this in my heart. And it's like there was this chip on my shoulder. And if you got a chip on your shoulder, that usually means there's wood higher up, you know? That's just my take. <laughs> um, and then I, I came across a, a card, a note this person had uh, written, and, and it, it totally 180 my perspective, and I, I recognized that the problem all along wasn't them. The problem was me, my heart, and, and needing to, to grow in humility, to think more highly of others than myself, to think less of me and me less often be thinking about others. And that's what James is going to encourage us to do throughout the letter because he did it. Fifth, James was martyred. Uh, James was martyred. So um, the um, circumstance of James' martyrdom, we learned from the Jewish historian jo Josephus. And what happened was James was brought to the temple, to the gallery of the temple, kind of like the balcony by um, the Jewish high priest and the sect of the Pharisees and, and the Jewish sect of Sadducees and scribes, the, the scholars of the law of Moses. And they ordered James to recant that Jesus was the Christ. And instead, Jesus, James proclaimed that Jesus was not only the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. And so they threw him from the gallery. And that obviously injured him severely, but it didn't kill him. And then they took up stones and stoned him to finish his, his life. And all the while, James was praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he's martyred. Now, now, most of us in this room are, are not going to be called to be martyrs. And, and unfortunately, people in this world have given their lives the ultimate sacrifice for their faith. In the last decade, over 900,000 followers of Christ lost their lives as martyrs for their faith. It's astronomical to, to let that sink in. The rise of persecution on this globe of Christians that... that as well as what we saw in the synagogue outside of San Diego, as well as what we saw in Sri Lanka last Sunday. But the, the rise in the Christian faith of martyrdom. And yet, most of us will never be called to make that sacrifice. Yet, understand this with me. All of us, all of us. She said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, that, that we have to die to ourselves." Take up our cross and follow him. 
All of us are, in effect, die to our will to then walk in his will. These are ways that James emulates Jesus. These are ways that we're called to emulate Jesus. He's a perfect example that we're to be people of prayer, people of the word, spiritual leaders that were to be humble like Jesus and that were to lay down our life. And so as you, you wrestle with that, you know, there's a tendency like, yeah, man, this is an area I really need to grow in. Um, there's also an awareness for me like, yeah, man, I need to grow in all of these areas. Maybe that's the right way for us to look at it. So we considered who James was or who James is. You know, he's resurrected. It's always awkward on the tense on this one. I don't know if I say who James was or who James is because James is now alive, reunited with Jesus, and, and praise God. So we've considered who James was or is, and now to whom did James write? So it's written to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. So 12 tribes. So whenever you hear this 12 tribes, immediately start to think of Jews, right? So it's the 12 tribes of Yaakov, of Jacob, his 12 sons. And so that's a Jewish sounding thought. And 19 times in this letter, James is going to refer to brethren. He's writing to Christians, okay? But they're Jewish Christians, you, you with me on this? Jewish Christians who are scattered abroad. And, and so this scattering happens, it starts to happen in Acts chapter 8, where the church is being persecuted by Jewish leaders. And, and so they're being driven out of Jerusalem, driven out of the southern area called Judea, just as Jesus had predicted in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria to the north, and then the outermost parts of the world. It, it's happening. They were really comfy just hanging out in Jerusalem and Judea. But now this persecution is the catalyst to fulfill what Jesus said was going to happen, that it was going to become this truly global religion. And so imagine this. They are being persecuted by Jews, so they have no refuge among the Jews. Gentiles, non-Jews, won't accept them because they think like Jews, not like Greeks or Romans. They are scattered. They are in this world, but not of this world. And that's how, if you're a follower of Christ, in some sense, you, you should be able to connect with this idea of being scattered. In other words, there's this sense that your values, your worldview is very different or should be very different than many of the values and many of the worldviews of the culture around you, regardless of what place you are living in this country or in this world. Do you appreciate that? So you feel like you're swimming upstream and you feel like scattered. I'm in this world, but not of this world. That was Jesus' prayer. Protect them, Father, for they're in this world, but not of this world. Now, I, I look at the culture around me and I, I see the, the events that are unfolding in, in this world. I see cultural shifts that are, are taking place. And I hear Christians lament and moan and shake a fist and, and proclaim through social media what they're upset about, what they're angered about, and I understand. And then there's this thing that, that California is just, it's lost. It, it's just gone too far. It's the end. And, and so I need to go to someplace else, wherever that someplace else would be. It's this idea of let's build an enclave to protect ourselves, to cloister ourselves from the influence of sin that's prevalent in the culture around us, or let's just pull up stakes and get out of here to greener grass on another part. Man, it got quiet in here. And... and what, what I, I want you to see with me, this is what James is saying, that, that is not the answer. Do you, do you appreciate that if you think California is messed up, you compare it to the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament, this makes it look like the Bible Belt in the 1950s. I mean, as whacked as this place is and has become and it will get, it, it pales in comparison to the depravity of the world that Paul and the disciples, the original 12, proclaimed the gospel to. Do you understand that? 
You, you see, in Acts chapter 17, Peter is gathered with Athenian philosophers, the, the great philosophers of Athens. These were people who previously meant like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. Right? And, and they conjured up and considered all of the varying philosophies. And they wanted to hear all the newest things to test them. And in that culture where they worshipped every imaginable God, Paul sought to proclaim to them about this unknown God. And during that great discourse in Acts chapter 17, he makes it clear to them that God is the one who appoints boundaries. In other words, nation states, whether you're an Athenian and you look at, well, here's what we've accomplished, and you, you look at the Spartans and look at the Corinthians and the Macedonians in northern Greece, and all of them would take pride in how they expanded their borders, and Paul would remind them that God is the one who sets those boundaries, not only of nation states, but of individuals. Do you See where I'm going with this? Probably not. But let me help you. You are not here in this country, in this state, in this region by accident. God brought you here and called you here with a mission to change your culture. Now, we may enjoy the blessing of living in this good land, a pleasant valley, a land, so to speak, flowing with milk and honey, with good schools, low crime, nice amenities. It's a good place to raise a family, etc. But that should not be your focus. Because then you're simply living for your comfort, your mission. God has called you to this place. You see, the... Old Testament, God's people, the Jews, gathered for two reasons, worship and warfare. In the New Testament, God's people are always centered around place, whether it's the church at Rome, the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Corinth, wherever the place is, God gathered people to influence place. And until God calls you to another place, you have a job in whatever place you're called to. If you're called to this place, Camarillo, the 805, rejoice. If you're called to another place, praise God. Stop living for your comfort and live on mission to glorify God because he's called you to that. Even though you might feel scattered, even though you might think that the response is, we got to get out of here. The response is, change it. Until God calls you to another mission and then change that place. Does that make sense? That's why James wrote to scattered people to help them to understand you need to live your faith in such a way that people recognize that there is a God of this universe and that he loves his creation, and he created them for relationship. And I know this is true because of not only what the Bible says, but his people are so distinct from the culture around them in their worship, in their love, in their lives of sacrifice for others. I want it. That's how we're supposed to live. Does that make sense? So we've talked about who James was, to whom James wrote, and let's consider uh, finally... Why did James write? Why did James write? We're, we're going to be introduced to the key verse of this whole book in just a, a couple of weeks in the first chapter, verse 22. There James writes, be doers of the word, not hearers only. That, that we're called to be doers of the word, not simply hearers, that if it goes in one ear and out the other, and it doesn't transform behavior. We're deceiving ourselves. We're thinking that we're something, that we're living our faith, but we're not. James is challenging us that this faith is to be lived for the glory of God. The second thing that James exhorts us about is to grow up into spiritual maturity. So six times in this letter, James is going to use the word that's translated in New King James translation as perfect. Uh, in the Greek, it's speaking of spiritual maturity or completeness. That we recognize that, that from the time we receive Christ until the time we go to be with him or he gathers us to be with him, gathers the church, 
that we're in a process of growing as disciples. This was the same exhortation that Peter concluded his last letter with. 2 Peter 3.18 But you grow in the grace and the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's nothing more enjoyable that any of us will ever experience than growing in the knowledge of Christ, in his grace, his unmerited favor and love towards us. To him be all the glory, both now and forever. Amen? Amen. That is a good place for us to conclude. I want to encourage you. Baptism. Baptism is a place to do. Baptism place for action. As Pastor Roger said, we are not saved through baptism, but it is something that we do in obedience to Christ. Jesus said of his disciples, his disciples make disciples, teaching them to observe all things that Jesus commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. And lo, he is with us always to the end of the age. In baptism, we identify with Jesus. When we go under the water, we're identifying with his death. When we come up out of the water, we're identifying with his resurrection. If you haven't been baptized and you consider yourself a follower of Christ, I want to encourage you to be baptized right here, right now. You might be saying, uh, I didn't dress appropriate. We have towels, T-shirts. We, we can give out. You might say, I don't have waterproof mascara. Come on now, bro. Don't let that hold you back. <laughs> Uh, People ask, what if I'd been baptized before as a child or I'd been baptized before? If God is stirring you and there's a fresh work that's going on, you want to acknowledge that there is no prohibition in the Bible in regard to baptism. So I'm going to pray and uh, then uh, I'll give you some instruction. If you close your eyes, open your hearts. If you're here today and you have not yet recognized Jesus as your Lord, he is inviting you. He's offering you the salvation as a gift received Through faith in Christ, a commitment to follow him, it's a gift of God. It's his grace. And we have nothing to boast about in it. And once we receive that forgiveness, we receive spiritual life so that we can now do the things that God is calling us to do that will ultimately end up in our satisfaction and will bring glory to him. And if that's you right now and you want to receive Christ right now in the quiet of your chair, say that whatever God is putting on your heart right now, to let him know you're ready to follow. For the many of us, oh Lord, who have already made that decision, help us now to live our faith. And for all of us, Lord, who are going to be here to support those who are being baptized, uh, we thank you for each and every one who is being baptized, those who are baptized earlier today, those who will be baptized in moments. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>